Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session, Time Marketing to Revenue with Marketo. My name is Jordan Kahn, and I'm on the product marketing team at Marketo. And I'm Brewster Stanislaw, head of product and strategy for analytics. And in, in the words of Steve Lucas, who you all may have met for the first time this morning, we are super pumped to be here with all of you today uh, to share how you can finally solve the, the truly age-old problem of actionably and accurately connecting your marketing efforts to the metric that really matters, and that's revenue. And so it truly is a, a, an age-old problem uh, for marketers. In the late 1800s, John Wanamaker is famously credited with saying this quote, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before. Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. And so if you fast forward over 100 years, uh, marketers are still facing the very same problem. Uh, you see here, according to this Forrester study, 48% of marketing decision makers lack the capability to measure results. And perhaps even more surprisingly, they don't even have the metrics that, to define success. <clears throat> In other words, if, if you look to your left, if you look down at yourself, one of you, statistically speaking, really needs to pay attention to this session because you're not very good at it. So we know it's the last session of the day and we're the only thing standing between you guys and happy hour. So hey, thanks for coming, that's really nice of you. I'd be having a cocktail, but we're happy you're here. Um, so we're gonna try and make this session engaging, interactive, ask a few questions and get some audience participation. So I'm gonna ask the first of those questions now. So by show of hands, how many people in this room can tell me how much revenue their marketing org drove in Q1? There's a few. Okay. There's a few, that's good. All right, next level up. How many of you can tell me what your highest performing campaign in terms of ROI was last month? Our, huh, a few. Pretty good too. All right, well for, for those of you who, who don't have your hands raised, you're not alone. Attribution is really hard. It, it hasn't been solved for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and, and it's really hard because uh, a lot of people are, are trying to do it on their own or, or do it with technology that wasn't purpose built for it. So we did a big user research study with the Marketo UX team, talked to a bunch of different marketers at various organizations, all the way from the enterprise to the SMB across many different verticals and many different sophistication to trying to figure out what are the key problems that everyone faces within analytics and attribution. And strikingly, there were a few patterns that we found. The first that we heard over and over again is, we have problems with data integrity. We don't trust the data, we don't have high quality data, we're not tracking everything, we have big gaps and we're missing things that are absolutely critical. So that's one theme. A second one, which I think is intimately related is, with all of the solutions we use, and I think we all know the MarTech landscape, right? Another 10,000 solutions every month, and I'm sure everyone in this room has many different solutions they use. You end up having all of this data in all of these different places. And it's extremely difficult to bring that data together in one place such that you can actually understand holistically what your audience is doing. And the third thing we heard was a lack of alignment. We heard, I have these set of numbers, and when I talk to sales, they think of something entirely different. I talk to finance, they see something different. I struggle to actually say, we're all on the same page about what our marketing numbers really look like. Yeah, and so I think our, our Marketo UX research team is actually here at Summit. So if you run into them, be sure to say hi, thanks for the quotes, and uh, please give them your feedback, what you love about uh, your analytics and, and what you hate about them. And they, they love learning about that and talking to people. Um, but really what Bruce was talking about, it really boils down to three points. Um, business to business marketers have to deal with long and non-linear journeys that can take anywhere from months to years to complete. I'm sure you've all dealt with a prospect who you thought was really engaged, who thought might close this quarter and then they disappear, they ghost you, they stop responding to your emails, they stop picking up the phone. Uh, you also have prospects who actually have to go backwards in the funnel before they go forward again. Again, really non-linear and, and not what you plan. Uh, they're also dealing with siloed and diverse data, as Bruce was saying. The, the B2B MarTech world has, it, has exploded, and it's not uncommon for uh, marketing teams to have dozens, even hundreds of different technologies that are creating and collecting different data sets that don't talk to each other. And I think a, a really easy example is if you have a prospect who comes to your page from Facebook on Monday and then uh, on LinkedIn, the next day they come to your page, and then on Wednesday they convert. Both LinkedIn and, and Facebook are gonna try to claim credit. They're not gonna talk to each other and be like, hey, you, you, you take 50% this time and I'll take 50%. They don't share as well as we do. Exactly, so you, you end up with silo data, and if you multiply that by all of your technologies, uh, it's a really big challenge. And finally, we're dealing with accounts and not individuals, and so you have to take all those individuals within the buying committee and unify that into a single, uh, single account journey. 
So I think this last quote here really sums it up. So I'm actually going to read it to you. So we're asked to grow at a really fast pace, and we literally have big question marks on what generates money. So this is from a marketer who's asked to grow top line revenue 20 to 30% and has no idea what is actually driving revenue. That's an impossible challenge to solve. How can you grow something if you don't even know what it is? So to illustrate that point, I want to keep you guys entertained. How much water did I just pour out? And anyone know? I don't know. You don't know because we weren't measuring it. And if you're not measuring it, you can't actually know what's working and you can't improve upon that. Love, love your water metaphor. <laughs> and so, <laughs> sorry, if we can go to the next slide. This is the journey we're going to go on for the next 35, 45 minutes or, or however long we have left. Uh, so we just established that connecting marketing to revenue is hard. Just like uh, figuring out how many ounces of water Brewster poured out on the stage right here we'll never know. Cup is really hard. And then we'll talk about uh, if you can't do it, it's really painful, um, especially in ways that aren't, aren't always super apparent. Um, and then we'll start to relieve that pain. We'll get you out of the cactus uh, by understanding the buyer journey and understanding the foundational elements of attribution data. And then finally, we'll turn those data into insights and those insights into action and help you supercharge your revenue. So another way we're going to make this interactive is by bringing up questions from you, the audience, on slides like this. Instead of chasing you around with mics, we're just going to go ahead and ask the questions for you. So here's one. A lot of you. So I appreciate you guys keeping the conversation going with questions like this. So what happens if I can't do it? Great question. Well, so the reality is connecting marketing to revenue is very hard. As we saw by the lack of hands we saw when I asked the question earlier, it's a very difficult thing to do. And I think we all know the quote that what gets measured gets managed. And so today when marketers can't measure revenue, they can't of course manage it, we gravitate to metrics that we can actually measure. And what can most marketers measure? Lead volume. But I think we all know that leads do not equal revenue. I think we all know that the quality of leads dramatically differs from one to another. Some are going to close and some will never close. So again, we're asking for audience participation by show of hands. Whose CEO knows how many leads you drove this quarter? Follow-up question for all, of those, for all of you with your hands raised. How many of you think your CEO cares about that number? A lot fewer. Very, optimistic, very optimistic marketers in the room here today. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Brewster. It's March Madness. We're in Vegas. I've got Duke winning it all. They squeaked by in this last round. But if I told you that in the final, they're going to attempt 60 shots, do you think they'd win? Would you put money on them winning? If Zion Williamson was taking all 60, definitely. But in lieu of that, definitely not. It's not enough information. Of course, because shot attempts don't equal wins. And there, there are so many other factors that go into it. The quality of the shots. Is, is Zion taking all the shots? Are they taking a lot of threes or twos? Are they playing good defense? Just like shot attempts don't equate to wins. Leads don't equate to revenue and, and winning in marketing. And the reality is, it's not enough just to connect marketing to revenue. You have to do it in a nuanced, sophisticated way that really helps you understand the entirety of the customer journey. So we went into our own data to do a little comparison of what happens when you compare a single touch attribution model with a multi-touch full path model. Now a full path model is one that's going to follow the buyer journey, the account journey, all the way from that anonymous first touch to closed one. And what we found when we compared these two different kinds of models is, the things that marketers are actually having direct impacts on, things like nurture campaigns, which got 356% less credit. I bet a lot of people in the room are here responsible for nurture campaigns. Things like outbound calling got 133% less credit. All the things that we have that direct impact on got less credit. And what got more credit were things like direct, web referral, the always dreaded other bucket. Who likes reporting on the other bucket? Is anyone going to raise their hand for that? I'm hoping not, right? And so in order for us to get the budget we need for our campaigns, for our initiatives, to do what we want to do next, we have to demonstrate the impact. We have to prove that what we're doing is really working. So you have to go beyond just a single touch model and think about multi-touch so you can show the entirety of that journey. Yeah, so when you think about what else happens if you can't completely and comprehensively connect your marketing efforts to revenue, uh, is, is that there's a great disparity in data. So we, we took a look at our, at our buyer journey and our analysis. We found that, on average, prospects took 167 touches before becoming a customer. Of those, 22 were, could be tracked by form fill. So if you're using kind of your garden variety, multi-touch campaign-based attribution, you'd get those 22 touches. And of course, uh, if you're only using single-touch attribution, you'd only see one of those touches. Uh, and, and this huge discrepancy in, in the data uh, makes a big difference in your insights and the learnings and your takeaways from the data. 
Um, and there's a really rich story that gets told with all 167 touch points that doesn't get told with 22 or 1. And so to, to put this in movie terms, uh, 167 touch points is like watching the full film on an IMAX screen, whereas 22 touch points is like just seeing the trailer or something like that. And then of course, one touch is, is the movie poster. So this past weekend, I think Us by, by Jordan Peele came out. I've seen the trailer, it terrifies me. I, I'm admitting this on camera and in front of all 600 of you. Way too scared to see it, but I did read, I did like the story, and I, and I wanted to read about the story. And seeing the trailer and comparing it to the story, there's just like no comparison in the richness and robustness and the creative genius of the story that gets told by the trailer versus the entire film story. So you're telling me it's not actually as scary as the trailer looks? I'll also admit it, way too terrified to see it. I don't know, I'm, I'm too scared to see it. So speaking of scary, this is what happens when you don't think about marketing as a revenue driver. At least a little quote here from Allison Snow at Forrester. If you don't think about marketing as a revenue driver, instead it's seen as a cost center. Or worse yet, a resource diversion. Or, or really worst case, the CEO, the management team starts to think about marketing as not even a strategic function. And I think all of us in this room know that marketing is as strategic, if not more, than any other function that exists. But in order to prove that, you have to speak the language of revenue. You have to get a seat at the revenue table. Show sales that you're driving just as much impact as they are. Show finance that you are a revenue driver, not a cost center. So moving the, the conversation along, thank you guys again for your, for your great question. Uh, at this point, you guys, are, you've, we spent 10, 12 minutes talking about pain and fear uh, in, in the movie Us. Um, but how, how do we get this, how does our audience get out of this pain? How do you do it? How do you do effective attribution? Can Mike Hedo do it? Oh, well, this is, this is awkward. Um, should, we just, should we just cut it now and just, oh, we, God. you wanna? Okay, no, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Hopefully you're still paying attention. Of course there's a solution. We wouldn't have teed it up for 10 minutes if there wasn't. And the solution is the world's leading B2B multi-touch attribution solution visible by Marketo. But before we jump into that product, I think it's important that we understand what actually makes up effective attribution. What do we need to do in data? What do we need to understand to really be able to deliver this? So I think, uh, hopefully this makes no sense to you, but I'll ask in a second. This is the state of what most marketers' data looks like today. It's in assorted silos, right? So we've got red stick figure who's interacting via paid media. We're engaging in LinkedIn. We're engaging via Google. We're also doing some engagement in events. But I mean, what does this actually mean? I mean, raise your hand if you could look at this, make sense of this, and say, I totally understand the account journey from this diagram. No thank hands. you, thank you. Nobody's trolling me, I appreciate that, right? So you actually have to put all of this together and show a continuous, cohesive account journey. And that's exactly what we do. So now we can see all of these touches have been put together on a linear timeline. So you know what happens at that very first anonymous first touch and how it happened and who it happened with, all the way over to a closed one opportunity and even into upsell as you start to build that loyalty with that account. That is a cohesive account journey. So if we dive in on one of these touch points, and what we like to think about is every engagement is a touch point with customer, and there's a ton of information associated with that touch point. There are three primary things I want to call your attention to. So one of these is the person. So red stick figure is not red stick figure. It's now Mark Evans. The second thing that's critical is understanding the stage. Where did this happen in the journey? What was the position at which it happened? Because that helps you understand what the value was. And the third is, what channel did it occur in? Where are we actually engaging and finding value? And you'll see this is a digital touch point, so there's a lot more metadata here as well. We understand where was that person when they interacted? What browser were they on? Where did they land? What keyword did they find? This is all critical information that you can use to slice and dice all of that engagement data, all of that attribution to get really neat segments that help you engage that much more effectively. For example, what works in organic search on the West Coast in Seattle might be very different in the East Coast. So you want to capture as much metadata as you can about each of these engagements so you can drive deeper analysis. And so to further that, let's actually take a look at this data directly in the Microsoft Dynamics CRM. So we actually push this data into the CRM. Again, it's about driving alignment between marketing and sales and the rest of the organization. So here you have the exact same customer journey, but we've layered on some attribution data right next to it across various attribution models. So if you can see in the first two columns that have dollar signs there, you know, you see that only one touch is getting all of that credit. Does that, like, does that make sense to anyone in the room? Does anyone look at that and think, that's a sensible approach? 
Thank you again, this is great. I'm answering how I want you to, thank you. Um, and so, you, so all the way to the right there and you see that full path model, which is actually giving credit to each and every one of those engagements, including the ones that happen after op creation. Something that we've seen in a lot of our data is that marketing to open opportunities drives a lot of value. It's not that marketing just hands off to sales. That's not how it is. It's about building a customer experience. And when marketing continues to engage with those open opportunities, they help to close the deal just as much as sales. So I want to call attention again to three critical things. The stage. Identifying what are your milestone stages. In this case, we have first touch, the first lead creation, the op creation, and closed one. But in your organization, it might be something entirely different. The creation of an SQL, an MQL, or anything else. What are the important stages in your journey? Your journey is unique. The next piece is understanding that channel. Where are we engaging? We don't just want to know when, but where. And then the last part is who, right? So we figured out earlier that red stick figure was Mark Evans, but now we're trying to bring the entirety of the buying committee into Clarity. So we've got Nuru Pama joining the mix, we've got Diana joining the mix, and now we understand all of the folks in that buying committee who are engaging to drive that opportunity forward. Great, so Bruce just set the, the foundation, the, the fundamental elements of attribution. So of course, you guys, knowing, knowing exactly what, what's next, you guys ask, what, what can I do with attribution data? How do I turn that data into insights? And when it comes to analytics data and attribution data, it all comes down to questions and answers. It's marketing teams that are asking the right questions and, and having the data to, to meaningfully answer them. And so we're gonna use this hierarchy of needs model, this pyramid, uh, to categorize the types of questions that marketers need to be asking. Um, so the most basic question, the bottom level of this pyramid, uh, is about proving impact. Marketers need, first need to prove impact. It, it's looking uh, in the rear view mirror to see where you've been. And, and just like that rear view mirror, it's not the best way to drive your car forward. And for marketers, it's not the best way to drive your company forward and, and drive growth. Um, but just like that rear view mirror in a car, it's in every single car. It's absolutely necessary to be able to prove your impact. So there are a few questions here on the slide. Um, I'm going to have Brewster answer them, actually, with a, with a demo of Visible. Um, and I know that there are a few, and for time's sake, maybe just answer one or two of them in your demo. Well, that worked better than I thought. Here we go. We're now in Visible's Discover application. And what we're looking at is a high-level overview of all the critical metrics we need to understand the efficacy of our marketing efforts. So we can see how much revenue we're driving, which was your question. This is exactly how much revenue we're driving here in Q1. We can see it's $8.7 million. But we're also showing a bunch of other ROI and revenue-centric metrics, right? Not the traditional kind of just lead that we might think about. We can see how much we're spending to drive that revenue, what the ROI of that spend really was, what it costs to actually close a deal in terms of marketing spend, how big those deals are, and of course, pipeline remains a critical metric. You can see here that we're using a custom if I can highlight that right, we're using a custom attribution model, which takes a machine learning based recommendation, taking a look at all of our closed one ops in the past, understanding which of the engagements actually helped to drive those to close, and then customizing it based on the needs of my organization, exactly what my stages are. Do I actually care about MQL and SQL, et cetera? And so with that, we have a clear idea of how much revenue we've driven in Q1. We also know exactly how that broke out across channels. So in this case, it looks like social was pretty effective, but it's key, again, to know where is that revenue really coming from as a marketing organization. So as I scroll down a little bit here, we'll see, we'll take this to the next step down the hierarchy from a channel to a sub-channel. So to illustrate what that means is, we talk about channels as paid search. A sub-channel would be something like Google or Bing. Now, what's the breakdown in Google or Bing? I won't speak to that because we're a very proud Microsoft partner, um, but I also want to talk about campaigns, right? So the campaigns that make up all of these sub-channels and channels which ones were actually proving most effective. You need that level of granularity to be able to optimize everything you do. So I think what we've just done here is prove, so I'm gonna I slide it on if you have some more yep. questions for me. Exactly, so once, we've able, once we're able to prove revenue, we're able to achieve that first level need, the next step is to prescribe and predict. It's, it's the stage where we're starting to optimize and it's really the first place where we're actually improving impact, we're not just proving impact. So our question's here, uh, where, where is the bottleneck in my funnel? I, I invested in a bunch of conferences this past year. Which one should I invest in next year? Should I invest in EMEA or APAC or North America or ANZ? Should I throw more money into uh, product line A or product line B? And really, where should I be spending my next marketing dollar? So let's start with the bottleneck in the funnel question. So to do that, we're actually gonna jump into a cohort funnel board here. Give us one second. 
Great. And so what we're looking at here is a cohort of opportunities that were opened in Q1. So as we scroll up, we can see that we had about 2,400 open ops. Uh, and of those, we closed one, about 172 of them, which is about 7%. Not a super good win rate. I, I think we can do better. I'd, I'd like to do better, certainly. Um, and so as we come up here trying to identify where is the gap? What are we actually missing? So in this case, it looks like we're only converting, I think, about 59% of our opportunities into scheduled demos. So that's really way too low. If we're able to open an op, we should get, be able to get a demo scheduled. We should be able to get them on the phone. So what we've identified here is this is a hole. This is a leaky in our bucket that we need to fix. So a couple ways that we could solve that, right? We might think about how do we run a meeting maker campaign with a direct mail or an email component or perhaps some new scheduled demo playbooks for our sales teams. Now you ask about a couple other areas of prescriptive analysis. So to do that, we're gonna hop over here and jump into our filter nav, and we'll actually take a look at, you said geo, right? Yep. Okay, so let's look at geo. Um, and so we're talking here about EMEA or North America, but we could filter down into APAC, ANZ, whatever the region is, right? I talked a little bit about understanding granularity of data so that you can segment, so you can understand your business at that very detailed level. And you don't just wanna do this around geo, you also wanna do this around product Line, whether you're selling widgets or enterprise software, again, the go-to-market motion might be different. What works to sell one may not work to sell the other, and that's critical, of course, for the largest enterprises. The other thing could be business segment, right? If we're selling to the SMB or to commercial or to the large, large enterprise, we need to be able to think about all those areas of our business holistically. What was your next question? My last question was, where should I spend my next marketing dollar? Where should I spend my next marketing dollar? So for that, let's actually jump into an ROI board and take a look here. So now what we're looking at is not just the revenue associated with each and every one of those campaigns, but actually the ROI. So as we come in here, we see a CRM attribution campaign, 17x ROI, that's pretty damn good. Uh, raise your hand if you'd be happy with 17x ROI on all of your campaigns. I want that. Who's still, if your hands aren't up, come on, audience participation. We all want that, we all need it, thank you, I appreciate it. But the reality about that campaign, what do we spend about $84 on that? Not very good scale. So I'm not sure we're gonna be confident that that one's gonna scale quite as well as we'd hoped. As we drop down into that meeting maker campaign, we can see that there's more like 10x ROI on 50K in spend. That looks like a better bet, especially because we identified there's this gap in the funnel. So this is a way that we can solve it. So now we have a campaign that we think is gonna work. The next step is to think about what creative are we gonna use. So we come down here and we see much the same phenomenon here, uh, a very, very high ROI piece of content with very low scale. So again, probably not what we wanna use. If we go down one more, we can see that there's a V2 of creative that's tied to that meeting, marker, meeting maker campaign that's both reasonably good scale and high ROI. So we're gonna bookmark that, we're gonna know that's what we should probably try to use to engage our customers. Maybe we could improve on it, maybe we'll run some A-B tests, well, we're gonna come back to that in a second. So the last thing I wanna do here is actually come back and actually look directly at that meeting maker campaign. So I'm gonna jump into the filters, I'm gonna actually filter down to just this meeting maker campaign, and it's a multi-channel campaign. So we see it had an email component, it had a direct mail component, and it had a paid social component. But what really proved most impactful, most effective here, was that email component. So when I'm thinking about how do I want to allocate resources, what should I put more dollars into, more effort into, it's probably email. So that's why they call us the pharmacists, because we've got more prescriptions than your local CVS. All right, so I'll, I'll run with your metaphor. Uh, if we move to the, the last stage, stage of, of this Maslow's hierarchy of needs for marketers, uh, it's not enough to just uh, go to the doctor, find out you're sick, get the prescription for medicine. You don't, that, that's not how you get better. You actually have to take the medicine. You have to act on it. Uh, so, so for marketers, that's taking the insights from your prove, your prescribe, and predict, uh, and, and feed it back in, into your plan and engage phases of marketing. Um, so when you think about kind of the analysis that you've just done for us, we realize that our, our meeting maker campaign was really effective. We know that the V2 version of that creative was the most effective for that campaign. We know that it was really effective on email. And we also know that in our funnel, uh, we're really struggling. Our bottleneck is at the open opportunity stage. So how do we put all those pieces together, all those insights, feed it back into Marketo to, to get healthy again? Yeah, so let's jump into Marketo and let's actually go run this meeting maker program. So as we get in here into Marketo, we can see 
but we had this campaign which worked in Q1. We were targeting ABC accounts. It worked pretty well, but we need to increase the scale. And specifically, we're trying to target those open ops. So what we're gonna do is grow that audience right here, and we're gonna use Marketo's new account profiling capability to say, let's create a lookalike audience. And a lookalike audience that has those same traits, but is specifically at the open op stage. So I'm gonna go in here, create that account, and now you can see we've added and we've expanded the audience, so we're still targeting those ABC accounts, but also lookalikes that are in the open op stage. So the next phase, now that we have an audience to target with this campaign, is to jump over here and think about the content. So as we recall, hopefully everyone in the audience remembers, it was the Creative V2 that worked best. So let's come in here and we can see we have that Meeting Maker follow-up V2 content. That's what we're gonna go ahead and use and that's what we're gonna choose here. But we also thought we could maybe do a little bit better, we could maybe improve. So to go ahead with that, we'll go ahead and run an A-B test. And in this case, what we're gonna be A-B testing is the subject. So we know that that content is really good. Maybe if we vary the subject line a little bit, we'll get even better open rates, we'll get even better click through, and we'll schedule even more demos, which is what we're trying to drive. So the last piece is, now that we have an expanded audience, we've got content, we've got some A-B tests associated with that content, we need to go ahead and schedule this campaign. And we know it's a multi-channel campaign, so we want that email to hit after we've sent the direct mail. We wanna make sure we properly sequence that. So we'll come in here, we'll schedule this campaign, and boom, there it is. So we're here in Vegas, and we talked a little bit about March Madness earlier, So, and we're at the Venetian. I don't know if anyone went to the Lagasse Stadium. I had to check it out. I'm a sports fan, so I went there. So I, I need you all to bear with me. I've wanted to do this for a long time, so please let me go ahead and do this, Jordan. Please forgive me. But I just want to say, bam! Because um, what we're able to do here is take insights out of Visible and feed those directly back into Marketo. So we proved that we had a campaign that drove 10x ROI on 50K in spend. We found that there was a gap in our funnel that we could solve with the Meeting Maker campaign, and then we jumped in Marketo to actually go ahead and solve that problem to drive the results that we need to hit our revenue targets. So if we take a step back for a second and think about the plan, engage, and measure framework, right? What's clear from this is plan, engage, and measure aren't silos. They're things that need to be interconnected. It's not measurement for measurement's sake. You need to take what you do around measurement and feed that back into all of your planning and all of your engagement. These all need to work in concert with one another. And when you take those insights from measurement and take action on them, that's how you drive the best results. Thanks, Bruce. A really nice demo, but uh, I, I can see that the skeptics in the room are speaking up and asking this question. So. Your demo is slick, it, it was nice, but is any of it real? Is anyone actually doing this today? Uh, and we're actually really prepared for that question, amazingly yeah, thanks enough. Thanks for asking it, that was great. Uh, so we'd like to take this time to welcome up to the stage Mervyn Alam here from Tibco. So here comes Mervyn, a little intro on Mervyn. <laughs> Mervyn runs Demand Gen, and Tibco has about 10 years of experience running Demand Gen across various enterprise software companies, and has been a visible customer for what, three or four years, years. now? Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're, we tried to get to you the hype bit. music from this <laughs> yeah, morning's right. keynotes, but they, they wouldn't give us the budget. Um, so thanks, everybody. Um, as they were saying, our journey at Tipco was not a one-month journey to move to a much more revenue-focused marketing team. It took a couple of years, and the reason why it took a couple of years is because when I first started about four years ago, the marketing organization was much more focused on physical events and more in-person type of marketing activities, right? And the request that we were getting from our CMO is how do we go and, and drive more leads, revenue, pipeline for our sales team? And at the time, there was no answer. There were just blank faces across the room because nobody would ever looked at how do you instrument marketing. So we brought on Visible and as for the main reason being we need to understand what are all of these touch points because all of this stuff was going on at the time in the news, in the analyst reports you're hearing that uh, three-fourths of the buyer's journey was happening even before somebody called one of our sales reps. And we had no information that kind of correlated that. So once we implemented Visible, the first thing that we started seeing is that they, there's these channels that were always invisible to us on the marketing side that started to pop up. And the things like organic search, like whoever really looks at organic search. And this was maybe four years ago in a B2B organization. So there wasn't getting, it wasn't getting a lot of mind share. 
Well, as we started investigating into organic, we looked at the landing pages that were driving the most revenue or contributing to the most pipeline. We understood much better how we can start to invest intelligently in marketing to drive the kind of outcomes that our CMO was looking for. So it started with just looking at the traffic. But then if you also look at paid activities, that was, that's actually where it was more important for us because that's where marketing budget goes. And that's when you have to sit across the table from finance and try to explain, you just got a big bu a budget for marketing in your first quarter, what was actually the return? And the first way that we can be able to relate and get some kind of uh, respect from our finance peers was to be able to come back to them and sh show them the data that, told, that tells them, these are the programs that we ran, these are the ones that had X ROI, these are the ones that we're actually impressed with, we're gonna go and invest more. And as we were starting to have that conversation, then our finance team would come to us mid-quarter and say, hey, we have some incremental budget, where do you guys wanna go and put it? Right, because we now had a lot more confidence from our internal partners as to how marketing, marketing can drive more pipeline, more revenue. So that was, that was the beginning of our journey. That was like probably year one. Year two of our journey, as we started instrumenting more of marketing, we started looking at what are some of the new technologies that, that are out there, whether it was uh, AI for marketing, whether it was chatbots that were out there, where, using intent. You know, these are all things that are great buzzwords, but were they actually contributing? Could they help us drive? And so by having this infrastructure that we had already put in place around visible, multi-touch attribution, looking at touch points, understanding the entire buyer's journey, all we had to do is pull in data from all of these other sources. So now we're able to look at our chatbot data within the context of the overall buyer's journey to understand, is it having an impact? We're able to look at our vendors that we leverage for intent and tie it back to those leads that are driving intent, and are they actually turning into pipeline and revenue for us, right? So in year two of this journey, we're able to become a little bit more complex, think a little bit more about advanced user cases. The biggest challenge that we had with multi-touch attribution and tying revenue back to marketing wasn't so much in the technology. I just talked to you and gave you kind of like the roadmap or the blueprint for how we did it. A lot of it was the change management inside of the company, especially within marketing. When you think about marketing four years ago, B2B marketing, revenue, it wasn't even in the same room. That kind of conversation never occurred. But as we started to surface this kind of data, we're able to give our marketers within the company the ability to go and drive more activities that their sales counterparts can now go back and say, oh, thank you you drove X amount of pipeline with this specific campaign or this specific event. That became a much bigger change within the organization. So when we talk about transforming marketing, going from uh, a marketing organization that was more focused on high touch events to a much more mar modern marketing organization, part of that was definitely the technology that we implemented that gave us all these insights and this visibility that we never had. The other side of it was the change management. Being able to have that kind of a mindset that allows you to take this new set of data and have new conversations with folks inside of your company. So that was, the, that was essentially the three-year journey that we took um, as an organization. And you know, today, we are sitting on lots of data. Fortunately, we've built out a very strong data warehouse that gives us a lot of insight. So we're not just looking at spreadsheets of data. We're actually looking at visualizations that we can go and share with other folks within the company with our CEO and show them, you know, these are the number of opportunities that we were able to create quarter over quarter. These are the programs that are driving them. So you can have a much and more intelligent conversation. And that's, that's essentially where we, where we are today. Thanks, Mervyn. So we, we've got a few questions for you, if you would take a seat. So you talked a lot about kind of bringing in new data with Visible uh, change management, and I know Whenever you bring it in new data, especially when you're talking about revenue and budgets, like that, that changes relationships. Can you, can you kind of dig into how um, bringing in Visible has changed relationships with you and uh, maybe some of the other teams at Tibco? Yeah, I mean, within our marketing team, that was probably one of the biggest changes because you had a, a team that was, um, at the time, not as focused on 
the ROI, the outcomes. And so when you go to somebody and you tell them that, oh no, you know that uh, event that you did a year ago, you thought it drove X amount of dollars, it actually drove one-tenth of that, that is a very difficult conversation to have. Um, and it takes a lot of, of a, a much strong growth mindset to be able to really adjust your perspective and look at it as, you know, that, was, that event actually drove the lead creation and I understand that my lead isn't automatically gonna turn into revenue. There's gonna be five, 10, 15, 20 other touch points or even a lot of other touch points within an account that we have to be considerate of. And so being able to not only show them the contribution from that one touch point, but now we can show them that one touch point came from an account of that account, you now have 15 people interacting with our marketing activities. So now you kind of give that, our field marketer, a much broader story that they can go and tell to their sales counterparts. And what about with the C-suite, with the executive team? How did this change the conversation with them and the perception of marketing? Yeah, I mean, you had a, a great line up there in terms of not being looked at as a cost center. Um, we have you know, over the past two years, had a lot of opportunities because of the, uh, the way that we've changed, uh, the way we think, the way that we communicate marketing activities back up to the C-suite, that if there is incremental budget that's coming, if there are opportunities where the company wants to reinvest and drive more pipeline or more revenue, marketing now is usually the first place that that investment goes. And we never would have been at that point had we not really built up this kind of infrastructure and this kind of uh, view of how marketing can, can tie directly to revenue. Got it. And with that additional budget, what, what did that do for actually resource allocation, right? So now you start to get more budget, you start to identify the things that aren't working, add those yeah. awkward conversations. Like, what's the next step from there? We actually think about what do we do with these resources? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I mentioned organic search. Um, so we typically don't invest, you don't really invest specifically in organic search, but you invest in those activities that will help drive more organic traffic. And so that's not the visibility that we had at the time, but with that kind of visibility now, we invent, when we do get incremental budget, it's to drive content that we know is going to result in more traffic to the website. We look at the content and we can now segment it by top of funnel, bottom of funnel, and then look at the contribution of top of funnel where we expect to get a lot of leads, and bottom of funnel where we expect to get a lot of conversions into opportunities or into wins, right? So that level of visibility allows us to take the budget, and if we know certain outcomes are expected from the budget, like we need to get a lot more awareness at the top of the funnel or a lot more leads, we know exactly what are the uh, activities and the programs to go invest in, by, on, on Converse, if we are looking to drive a lot more revenue in quarter or in the next couple of quarters, we now know exactly what are those types of activities that that budget can be applied to. Yeah, I love that. So I think we all know that like sales is very quarterly driven. At the end of the quarter, they're, they're heads down trying to close deals. Or, and marketing is not always like that. Um, I think there is that quote that sales sometimes sees uh, marketing as like a resource diversion or a, a cost center. Um, and I think sales and marketing alignment is a really important issue, and I think a lot of our, the folks in the audience are, are thinking about that. Maybe they're getting hounded by their, their VP of sales about why, why they're not driving enough leads or something like that. How has uh, attribution and, and the ability to connect your marketing efforts to revenue uh, changed your relationship with your sales team? Yeah, alignment's critical because uh, from a marketing standpoint, you cannot be successful if you're not well aligned with your sales team. And your sales team won't have a good relationship with you if you can't show how you're contributing to their success, right? Um, so with a lot of what we're able to do now with, with this view of touch points, what we do for our sales team and how we enable our field marketing teams or the marketing teams that work directly with sales is that we create these views of an account. So now a sales rep doesn't necessarily just look at it as a marketing activity of a lead that came to an event and registered and never turned into an opportunity, they can see that in, across an entire account, there may, have been, there may have been over 100 touch points in the previous three months. And because of the way our funnel works, they may have only seen five of those touch points because those were five were converted into contacts within Salesforce. They don't see everything else that's happening on the lead side. And so that was an opportunity for us to really drive a lot more alignment and just show 
the amount of impact that marketing can have on an account that's theirs in order to drive more activity and ultimately more revenue. So you've shared a lot of wisdom here, a lot of knowledge with the crowd. One last question for you. Any kind of practical tips or practical guidance that you can give to everyone out here who's kind of thinking about the similar journey in their organization? Yeah, I mean, uh, from an attribution standpoint, or even when we talk about revenue, always having a really strong base, uh, having clean data. I know one of the challenges that we had when we first started is getting to, getting to a point where you have clean data, but that's critical. It's an important step because that's the foundation where you're going to Im implement and build on top of. And then having the patience. I think patience, especially working with um, all of your other marketing counterparts, all of the, co the teams outside, is being able to become a teacher, right? And as a teacher, be very patient because people are not going to grab a lot of the concepts that you're trying to describe to them, like multi-touch attribution, touch points, um, fractional attribution, all of these different terms. So you have to be able to translate that into a way that they can understand in order for them to come along on this journey that you want to bring marketing to, where, we, where we're able to drive a much bigger impact on revenue. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mervin. I really appreciate you, you joining us. Um, I think we're, we're the only thing keeping all of these folks between their, their welcome happy hour. Yeah. So, so let's, 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 that, let's finish off. Let's finish strong. Thank you, Mervin. Okay. <clears throat> so we really appreciate that. And I know you, you covered some uh, of the practical guidance and how to get from where you were three years ago to where you are today as a, as a revenue driving machine. Um, but when, I, when I'm sitting in, in your guys' spots uh, at these conferences, I really want, uh, want something to know so that when I go back to the office on Friday or, or Monday or whenever you guys are all going back to the office, I know exactly what I need to do. Uh, I want that roadmap to get started and, and I have that destination of this revenue-driving revenue machine. How do I get there? So. Mervin already gave you some of this advice, and I'm going to echo it. We like to take a crawl, walk, run approach to achieving success with attribution. So I'm going to walk you up this stairs right here. So it starts with developing a revenue mindset. This means that even if you're not attributing, even if you're not measuring revenue, you have to establish that you are a marketing organization that believes revenue is your most critical KPI. So when you take your KPI sheet, put revenue at the top of it. Even if you don't know the answer, write TBD. Write a question mark. Show sales, show the executive team that you care about revenue and you're starting the journey to be able to measure it. Once you've made that commitment, once you show that you're dedicated to that revenue mindset, the next step is being able to actually understand what that journey looks like. We showed those silos earlier with everything was all over the place. You need to understand the entirety of the journey. Digitally, you need to know each and every interaction, every engagement from a webinar to a web visit, and as much metadata as you can associated with that so you can tell the complete picture. Once you have all of that data in place and structured such that you can actually attribute against it, the next step naturally is to do that attribution, to adopt multi-touch attribution, to start to say, this is what's working and this is what's not. Measuring revenue, measuring ROI. And when you get to that level of sophistication, then you start to think about, well, what's unique about my organization? What does my go-to-market look like? Because everyone in here has a different go-to-market. They've got different products. They've got different audiences. And so you need to think about what can I do that's appropriate for my team, for my marketing org. So adopting machine learning-based modeling for all of your attribution to customize your modeling such that it fits across the entirety of your business and each individual segment. And the last piece here, which is really the expert level, is to start acting programmatically because Insights are only valuable to the extent that they're actionable. So knowing what's working and what's not is all well and good, but if you're not able to act on that, so what? Right? And so the key is being able to take that programmatic action. We showed you here today going back into Marketo and running that meeting maker campaign, taking action on the insights that we got out of analytics, feeding that measurement loop back into all of your planning and all of your engagement. And the last piece that I want to talk about here is that purple bar across the bottom, which is at every stage of this journey, you need to share your learnings with the other folks in your organization, not just in marketing, but in sales, finance, everywhere else. Tell them that you have that revenue mindset. That. Bring them along with you on that journey, because when you get to the end, you're going to be aligned, because they came along with you. So continue to share everything you learn and teach those folks. Mervin talked about it, how to be a teacher. Teach everyone else in your org so you can get there together. Awesome. So if you remember back uh, maybe 40 minutes ago, we, we opened the session with some pretty sad and some doomsday-ish 
uh, stats about how, how marketers like, like all of you really struggle with this kind of age-old problem of attribution. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. With this crawl, walk, run framework that Bruce just explained, uh, all of you can, can grow that comfort and those capabilities of working with really rich and robust attribution data and, and act on it. Um, and so if we kind of finish out our, our Maslow's hierarchy, if we, we've self-actualized, we have ascended with attribution to Nirvana. Bruce and I are from Seattle. When we Nirvana, we get uh, grunge rock. But if it's, it's sitting peacefully at the top of a mountain in, in silence, that's good on you. Uh, but there's three pieces to it. Uh, first, you need easy and accessible data to prove impact on revenue. And so as Bruce just said, that's every channel, that's every person, and that's every stage in the funnel. Uh, second, you need flexible reporting to prescribe and predict your performance. And finally, you need those actionable insights that enable you to overperform, to grow your company and, and hit your goals. So with that, we want to thank all of you for coming. We hope that we've helped you understand a little bit more about how to develop a revenue mindset, how to think about implementing attribution in your organization, and how to drive more revenue going forward. We've got a happy hour going on, but we're going to be up here for some Q&A. So if you have any questions at this point, please raise your hand. We'll run the mic to you, and we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you, everyone.